Welcome to BrainFluence. I'm Roger Dooley. Today's guest is a special treat for me as his work has influenced my own in a major way. Matt Dixon is the author of three best-selling books, The Challenger Sale, The Effortless Experience, and The Challenger Customer. Matt's latest book is The Jolt Effect, How High Performers Overcome Customer Indecision. He's a frequent contributor to Harvard Business Review on sales and customer experience. Matt is a founding partner of DCM Insights, a boutique consultancy. Previously, he served in leadership roles at organizations like Tether, Corn Ferry Hay Group, and research firm CEB, now Gartner. When I was writing Friction, the research Matt and his colleagues at CEB did helped shape my thinking about the effect of effort on customer behavior. In recording this episode, we experienced some technical difficulties that led to much of my video and audio being corrupted, so I'll be filling in for myself after the fact as needed. Luckily, Matt's end of the conversation was recorded without a problem, so you've got 100% of the good stuff. Enjoy the show. Yeah, man, I'm curious. You know, you would think that by now your theme would have been put out of business. Why do companies <laughs> continue to create such effortful experiences? It seems like by now everybody should know the too much effort is a very bad thing. It's funny, uh, Roger, you know, my, I remember when I wrote the book and I gave a copy to my mom and she said, are you telling me companies don't actually understand this yet? Uh, that, that this is what customers want. And I said, you, you know, you'd be surprised actually. <laughs> the, uh, companies, companies t think you want something totally different. Uh, they think you want to be wowed and excited. And she said, well, you, they don't do a very good job of that either. <laughs> so it's, it's one of those things that everybody knows about it. Years ago, I was uh, going to speak at a conference, uh, sort of an elite entrepreneurial conference. And uh, I said, well, I'm going to talk about friction, uh, wasted effort. And they said, oh, no, no, everybody knows about friction. You got to do something else. <laughs> so, you know, it's like uh, if everybody knew about yeah. it, it seems like we'd have a lot better better experience. On that point, it's an interesting one. I, I, my sense is people, uh, companies do know about friction. I, I think what they struggle with is a couple of things. One is they, they don't know really or don't appreciate the impact it has on customer loyalty. But I also think that they don't really know how to fix it. You know, the real I remember... Years ago, um, Roger, we were you know we were talking recently about an airline experience you had. I was presenting to one of the big airlines uh, in Europe, and I remember putting up on a screen all the drivers of customer effort, like repeat contacts and channel switching, and repeating your story over and over again, and getting transferred or escalated, and you know these kinds of things, being forced to jump through hoops. And uh, and the, the head of the group, the customer service group, kind of started laughing. And I, I was thinking, of course, you're laughing. You're an airline. You enjoy doing this stuff to your customers. But that's not why he was laughing. Why he was laughing is he said, you know, that's our project list. That was our project list last year. Those are our priorities to knock those things out. And by the way, that was our list the year before and the year before that. And I'm pretty sure it's going to be our project priority list next year. Like, tell us something we don't know. The problem is we don't know how to fix these things. Uh, so I, th I think that's... I think that's probably more the more the issue I run into with companies. Right. Probably uh, it's difficult too. I mean, they may know how to fix them, but fixing them is expensive. I mean, I'm sure that that's right. Uh, these yeah. Airlines are uh, running on legacy code in a lot of cases, and uh, they can't really uh, change the website easily. Uh, yeah. Without fear of breaking it and such. Uh, but yeah. uh, it's uh, it's an, so it's difficult to affect change. In fact, I I just did a, a workshop for an Austrian company in New York mm -hmm. City, and the a leader in that group who was not uh, at the highest executive level in the organization uh, said, in our company, uh, fighting friction is a high fr friction experience. <laughs> Meaning yeah, that, well, well he said, knew yeah. that there would be a lot of resistance to oh, making yeah. change uh, that would change, change the variables that we want. Making to. things but, easy is hard, it uh, turns any, out. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, before we jump onto the Jolt book, is there any new data uh, from the effortless experience? Because effortless experience is uh, some years old now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, looking basically at the, uh, you know, the effects of wasted effort on loyalty, uh, have you developed any new data since then? A few things I would uh, throw out there. So one, my my co-author on the new book, The Jolt Effect, was a guy named Ted McKenna. And he and I spent about uh, four years at a, a conversation intelligence company called Tether. And they actually work with a lot of, a lot of brands, both B2B and B2C. Um, but we actually use a lot of their machine learning platform to continue to explore the contours of, of effort reduction 
you know, what creates effort for uh, for customers? What are the things that great companies do to minimize effort or reduce effort? And uh, we were able to use unstructured data, right? It recorded phone conversations and chat interactions, email exchanges, SMS exchanges, things like that. The original research, of course, was was built off of survey data. And so this has been fascinating to now be able to look at millions and millions of actual customer service interactions and, and look at how, it, how does effort actually play out, not as a customer recalls it and, and fill, how they fill out a survey after the fact, after their service experience, but actually how it happens in the moment. So I think you know it's really enriched our understanding of effort. Uh, I would share with uh, listeners is that I think if we look back on uh, the effortless experience, I think there's probably two places where if we were to rewrite the book today, the two areas I'd focus on to update it. I think the first one is around this whole question of digital, right? So we talk about digital creating a sticky self-service experience is something that low effort companies do. Obviously, I think our take on technology and digital was probably obsolete as soon as the book came out because technology, as you know, changes so dramatically. I'll give you an example, like something like an omni-channel experience back in 2013 was just like this figment of the imagination. It was something vendors were talking about, but you couldn't find any companies actually doing it. Fast forward to today, and you've got platforms like Service Cloud and Customer and Gladly, and you know the the list goes on and on. Who are actually delivering this kind of seamless omni-channel experience to brands all over the world? So you can find hundreds, if not thousands, of companies delivering that kind of experience. So that these things have changed pretty dramatically. Now, the other area I think we'd have to do an update is on the frontline experience. And because I think what's happened is there's two things there. One is as we get better at self-service and digital, what happens is the easy stuff goes away. And then what's left over for the live service representative is by definition, the more complicated things. You know, these are the things that you the customer couldn't solve on their own, that you couldn't have an AI, like a chatbot or virtual assistant handle. You actually need to talk to a human being. And so that's really changed the employee experience, the frontline agent or representative experience. When you layer on top of that, the second thing is is work from home. And and what what's happened in a world where you know service representatives are now working out of their, you know, basement offices, home offices, you name it with the dog barking and the kids and the the FedEx guy at the front door and yeah, you know, they've got all these distractions and they don't have their peers surrounding them anymore that they could le- lean on to help them solve some of those more complicated issues. So you're finding issue complexity going up and the support or surrounding the representative uh, kind of going down or if you will uh, being lessened. Uh, in this work from home environment. So I think that creates a really challenging job for the frontline representative. Um, I'd point your listeners toward two articles we wrote that came after the book. One is called Kick-Ass Customer Service. The other is called Reinventing Customer Service. Both of those were in Harvard Business Review over the past couple of years. And I think they're a good window into how do we think differently about hiring, skill development, and in building the right culture for our service organization so that they can really thrive in this world of much more demanding customers, much more complicated issues, and and do it in a world where they're often on an island by themselves without their colleagues and managers uh, you know, at the ready to help them. Matt's latest book is The Jolt Effect. A key focus of the book isn't on sales lost to competitors, it's on sales lost to indecision. Here's why Matt thinks indecision is so important. That's right. So we, we've we been tracking this, uh, Roger, for the past few years. But what we found in our research is that the, anywhere between 40 and 60% of the average salesperson's pipeline is are deals that are actually lost to no decision. So to be very clear, these are customers who will go through the entire purchase journey. So if you're in a transactional, even a, a consumer uh, setting, let's say you're selling insurance or home services or you know cars or what have you, like cable, uh, you know, uh, mobile phones. It doesn't matter. Pick your pick your consumer product. These are customers who will spend a lot of time with your representatives, your sales reps in your call center, or if you think about business to business, these are customers who will go through the entire you know six month purchase journey, evaluating your solution, talking to your reference customers, kicking the tires on your product, having you do demo after demo after demo, you know proof of concept trials, pilots, you name it, building proposals, only to end up doing nothing. And and I think if you if you look at that, forty to sixty percent of the average salesperson's pipeline, and then you multiply it across a team, then you multiply it farther out across an entire organization. This is a problem that represents a massive deadweight loss for a commercial organization. 
And it's a problem that's getting worse literally before our very eyes. I I was in uh, at the salesforce.com conference a couple of weeks ago, the Dreamforce event in San Francisco. And I remember presenting the content around the jolt effect early in the week. And uh, there's one one guy uh, from B2B company came up to me afterward and said, I think our I checked with our sales ops people. I think our no decision loss rate is about 45%. So yeah, this is a big problem for us. And we don't pay enough attention to why this happens and, and what we can do differently. He came back to me. I saw him again at the end of the week. And he said um, he his sales ops person told him just in that week, given the down economy and, and all the scrutiny that's on big purchases right now, that number was over 50%. So just in the span of like five days, that number had for a single company had moved multiple percentage points. And I think a lot of companies are seeing that now. They're seeing a lot of initiatives canceled. They're seeing a lot of customers who were engaged early on suddenly ghost them, go radio silent, disengage from the purchase journey. And again, it's it's a huge cost to us uh, in sales. Conventional sales wisdom is that the reason most customers don't make a decision is status quo bias. If you're faced with a decision that doesn't have a clear winning option, it's preferable to do nothing. Why change if you don't have to? The typical sales response to this is to sell harder. Reiterate your benefits. Ramp up fear of what might happen without your product. Matt explains why this doesn't work. When you think about what salespeople are are trained to believe um, and what, what what they're told by their managers and what their managers are told by their sales leaders, it is very much what you just said, which is, look, if the customer starts to disengage, if they start to show signs of heading down into that wasteland of no decision, it's because they are still suffering from status quo bias, right? You haven't put the status quo to bed. Either they believe what they do today is good enough. Uh, they don't believe that your your product or your service is a compelling enough reason to change, right? It's not a superior enough alternative. Or maybe they just don't think it's a top priority, right? I've got other other priorities, other fish to fry. But all of those reasons are because they have they've are still committed to their status quo and you need to break the gravitational pull of the status quo. And as you said very well, like every salesperson knows that customers regularly will pass up on better opportunities sitting right before them in, in instead just keep continuing to do what they do, right? People are lazy. They like to avoid change. So it takes a lot to get somebody off their status quo. But in a world where salespeople have been taught that anytime a customer starts to ghost you or disengage or go radio silent or start to, you know, get cold feet is because you haven't, beaten the status quo, what we tell salespeople to do is go back uh, and do a few things. So first, of, the first thing we tell them to do is go back and re-articulate the benefits of, of our product and service. So Roger, you must have missed when I showed you how many zeros there were on that ROI calculation and how much money you're going to make by, you know, how much money you're going to save and how great this is going to be. So we try to paint the rosy picture. If that, if that fails, the second thing we tell salespeople to do is dial up the FUD, right? To the fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Uh, to try to create a burning platform, make the customer squirm a bit, right? You know, Roger, these problems are not going to, you can't wish them away. They're not going to solve themselves. Um, your competitors are all using our product and they're seeing tremendous benefits. And I'd hate for you to be left alone with your terrible current uh, current solution. So again, we try to get the customer to realize the cost of their inaction. And the third thing we often see salespeople do is they try to use that sort of disappearing discount. Like, well, you know, I, I understand you might, this might not be the right time, but you know, that 10% discount I, I gave you is really only good this quarter. And I can't give you that price next quarter prices go back up or leveraging like a, uh, an implementation window. So we'd love to get you up and running with our solution, but our platform, but we only have a certain number of implementation slots. If you don't sign up now, I can't guarantee you when we'll be able to get this installed for you. Think about supply chain shortages, right? Nope. We only have a certain number of those products in stock, and I don't know when we'll get it back in stock. I can, cannot guarantee. So if you don't buy it, you know we've only got a few left and nothing I can do. So we, so what we're trying to do is get the customer off their status quo by dialing up the FOMO, right? the fear of missing out. And what we found in the research is that uh, that more often than not, those techniques actually backfire. Uh, they, don't, they don't actually get the customer off the fence. In fact, they make it more likely the customer will, will do nothing. And the question is, is why? And, and you asked it before. So what really is driving the customer to become in, indecisive? And what we found is it's it's not your your inability to make them appreciate the FOMO, to dial up the FOMO. It's the FOMU. It's the not the fear of missing out. It's their fear of messing up. And so when we actually look at that uh, in, in detail, what we find is this is a good representation of not status quo bias, but what's called omission bias. Omission bias is about um, when I'm looking at two paths. One is a path where I, I lose 
but it's it's through inaction. I something bad happens, but it's because I did nothing. Versus something bad happens because I did something. Human beings are wired to avoid uh, the second that second path and to go for the first path. Nobody wants to be on the hook for a loss that they are personally responsible for. Now, the, the question I think salespeople often ask is, well, what are customers so worried about? It turns out in our research, we found three specific fears that they have. There are three specific types of FOMU or fears of messing up. The first one we call a valuation problem. Valuation problem is where the customer doesn't know what to pick. So, you know, whether you're looking at you know, homeowner's policy, so it's a consumer purchase, or whether you're looking at a million dollar software implementation for a business, a B2B purchase, there's so many different options that we can consider. There's different contract lengths, there are different integrations, there are different bells and whistles, there's premium versions, basic versions. You're rolling out software, you could buy 10 seat licenses, you could buy a thousand. You know, there's all kinds of different things we can consider. A valuation problem is when the customer's looking at all this stuff and it all looks good to them, and they struggle with the question of what not to buy right? Because I can't have it all. So when I decide what should be in the package I eventually sign up for, I don't want to make a mistake. I don't want to pick the wrong thing. I don't want to take the wrong thing out of the shopping cart. And I worry that if I do that, it'll become an irreversible decision. So that's the first type of FOMO. The second type is a lack of information. So there's this irony, uh, Roger, I think in the world today where take any purchase, whether it's buying a new laptop, buying a car, buying, a, again, a, a complex, um, expensive solution for your business. There's so much information out there for customers, B2C and B2B, to research every kind of purchase decision they might make. I mean, we could spend a lifetime researching it before we ever consume all the available information. And so while there's so much information out there, and I think maybe because there's so much information out there, the second type of FOMU is when the customer feels like they haven't consumed enough of that information. They're not a savvy enough consumer. As you know, the old saying, buyer beware, right? And it's the customer feeling like it's the next white paper I read or the next customer review I, or the next reference call I do that will show me all of this mistakes to avoid in buying this product or this service. The third type of FOMO is called outcome uncertainty. That is, um, outcome uncertainty is very specifically where the customer fears they won't get what they're paying for. Now, it's not it's it's not nefarious, meaning that um, they're not worried that the company is going to take their money and not give them anything. That's that's not really the concern. Their concern is more that they won't fully get the benefits. So imagine I'm selling a business solution to you, and we've built a business case on like a 10x ROI, and it's going to lead to these great growth in your business and, and cost savings and all these great things. It's the customer worrying about, well, what if we only get a 5x ROI? And if that happens, I'm going to have, I'm gonna, it's going to be a bad look for me. And in the current environment, I could actually lose my job. You know, think about a big expenditure in the current environment where there's so much scrutiny, so much risk aversion, the customer putting their badge on the table and saying, we're going to go forward. We're going to buy, we're going to partner with this vendor. We're going to buy the solution. It's, it's going to generate tons of money for us. And when that doesn't come to pass, Somebody gets called to task for that. You know, I, I was presenting this recently to, as I mentioned, the Salesforce conference. I had a, a VP of software came up to me afterwards and said, I suddenly realized we do this all the time. We tell our salespeople to do this is, is when the customer starts to get cold feet, dial up the FOMO. And what I suddenly realized is in the grand scheme of things, missing out on a 10% discount versus losing your job, it turns out that they care more about losing their job. <laughs> and so I don't know why we do this, but it, it makes perfect sense. And it, it's... It, this, these are human concerns. These aren't even about you know customers versus other. You know, these this is just the way we're wired as human beings. And I think for so long in sales, we've just told people every indecisive customer is a nail, and you got to use your FOMO hammer to to beat on those nails. But it turns out it's the FOMO that keeps them from moving forward, not the not the lack of FOMO, if you will. So Matt, given that the indecision issue is not status quo bias, it's uh, this uh, uh, FOMO or various various other issues. Uh, what are uh, so I realize you wrote an entire book about this, but in a nutshell, what are some ways uh, that uh, people in sales can uh, deal with this type of indecision ra rather than uh, trying to uh, either invoke scarcity or uh, other issues like that? So the book is called The Jolt Effect, and it turns out Jolt is an, actually an acronym. And I'll tell you what those four techniques are that it speaks to. We found these in our analysis, which again, we looked at two and a half million uh, recorded sales conversations and use machine learning to study those. So we found these actual behaviors. These were not things we invented. It's things that star salespeople kind of came up with on their own because they, they realized this is a big problem, not being able to dial down the FOMU. So they came up with this playbook on their own. We just gave a framework uh, for it. We like Jolt because it's it's memorable, but it also says what's happening here, right? We're, 
we're kind of jolting the customer out of their stuck, uh, indecisive state. Um, so the first technique is the J is judging the level of indecision. Everything starts there. We need to understand what is the the source of the customer's indecision, what's causing them to become indecisive, how indecisive are they at a personal level, and are there other contextual amplifiers? For instance, an economic downturn where there are a lot of eyes on every single purchase decision, or maybe it's a customer who's gotten burned in the past by a vendor. And so there's a lot of baggage that they're bringing to this this decision right now through no fault of your own as a salesperson or as a supplier, but the customer is bringing that to the table and it's amplifying their indecision. When we do that, you know, the, the funny thing about indecision is it's it's not something people are comfortable talking about. If you ask customers, they'll all say they're decisive people, but we actually know from the data, 87% of those sales calls we studied had customers with either moderate or high levels of indecision. So the reality is actually quite a bit different from how we tend to think of ourselves. And so it's everywhere, but it's really hard for salespeople to detect. So we need to dial in our active listening so we can spot those signs of indecision and what customers are saying. And then we've got to develop techniques to be able to get the customer to articulate their fears? How do we get them on the table so that we can talk about them and, and do something about them? Now, why that's important is it tells us, well, what's our playbook for getting the customer across the finish line? And then, of course, it tells us when we should forecast this opportunity to close this week, this month, maybe next year. And is this even worth our time? Or should we pull, you know, pull up the 10 stakes and maybe spend our time elsewhere? So that's a J. The O is offering your recommendation. So we know in sales that one of the things we love to do is put lots of options in front of our customers. And, and that's actually options and choice are a bit of a double-edged sword. Uh, for any of your listeners who are familiar with uh, Barry Schwartz's book around the paradox of choice, we found is that that really plays out in sales big time. Customers, when you put lots of options in front of them, they get really excited. They love that you, your your solution, your product is is it can be integrated with almost anything else that they have. It's it's totally configurable for their needs. There are all these new roadmap items like bells and whistles out the yazoo. And, and so they, they love that. But the problem is when they go from talking about an idea to actually having to buy something, that does require some hard choices, namely what what's going in the shopping cart and what's coming out. And what most salespeople tend to do is they, they kind of, when the customer starts to look at everything, say, boy, this all looks great, Roger. I don't know what what should be in the final proposal? Because I, I don't know what to say no to. It's like looking at a buffet and everything looks great. And they they struggle with making those choices. What most salespeople do is they put the decision back on the customer. Well, Roger, tell me what's really important to you in your business. Let me, let me, and my hope is by asking you the right questions, you'll figure it out on your own. But that's a little bit like going to a restaurant and seeing 20 great items on the menu. And you ask the waiter or waitress what you should order. And they say, well, what are you in the mood to eat? It's actually not very helpful. What you'd rather is that waiter or waitress say, you know, everything, Roger, we make here is wonderful. You can't go wrong, but this is my favorite dish. And, and if you want something a bit lighter, I'd go with this one. That's a great one too. That allows, the, and what we found is that's what best salespeople do. They will let a thousand flowers bloom, but then at some point they break out the weed whacker and they get to a narrower consideration set and they put a personal recommendation on the table. What happens in that moment, something called delegate theory, it, it allows the customer to shift some blame for a bad choice onto the salesperson. Just like you would if, if the waiter or waitress recommended their, their, their awesome dish and you didn't like it. It's not totally on you. It's a little bit on them because they recommended it. The third one is limiting the exploration. So this is all about getting our customers. Our customers will want to be experts. They don't want to buy a thing until they've read all their user reviews. They've done all the research. And the problem is they can't consume all the content. It's 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 physically impossible. They'll they'll spend a lifetime and they'll never consume all of it. And so how do we get the customer to stop wanting to be an expert themselves and start seeing us as an expert, as a salesperson? Not just an expert, but a trusted expert. And you know, the analogy I use here, Roger, is <clears throat> if you think about it. Imagine you um, were planning a trip to Italy with your family, and you've never been there before, and, and, you're, and you're out there shopping for a travel agent. Would you want to work with a travel agent who also has never been there and never planned a trip for anybody else, and who maybe you suspect his only motivation is to get you to stay in five-star hotels and fly first class because that's going to be more money in their pocket and try to oversell you? Or would you want to work with a travel agent who said, I understand exactly what your budget is. And in fact, I think we can save you a little bit of money and you're going to have an awesome experience because I go to Italy like 10 times a year. I owe, I'm totally in the know. I plan hundreds of vacations that I've been, you know, look at all these thank you notes I've gotten from my travelers. They love the trips I put together for them. Like that is a trusted advisor, right? And so it's a term we use a lot in sales, but we don't often define what it means for salespeople. So we've got to take key moments and we've got to establish that trust uh, that we're not there to hide the ball or hide the dirty laundry or or sell the customer more than they need. 
and also position ourselves as an expert, as an advisor. And there are key moments where salespeople can do that um, in our analysis. Again, in, if your customer doesn't trust you and doesn't see you as an expert, that's a customer who's going to do their own research. And they will engage qu very quickly in analysis paralysis. We found that when, and this is a danger for salespeople, last thing I'll say on this one, because when the customer is asking for more content, they're asking for like another demo or another reference call or another, another white paper, that feels to the salesperson like they're making progress, right? We can put it on the CRM system. They're moving toward, they're engaged in the, the learning journey. They're moving towards a decision. But what best salespeople know is that that's a recipe for analysis paralysis. They're, they're going to end up just endlessly consuming and never end up making a decision. So I've got to get them to stop trying to be an expert and to trust me as their guide and their expert. And the T is taking risk off the table. So remember that outcome uncertainty we talked about. I might not get all the benefits I'm, I'm, I expect from this purchase. We've got to establish a safety net for our customer. And that could be as simple as an opt-out clause or a prorated refund clause in your contract. But in complex purchases, it might be something like adding professional services to the agreement. So we can make sure if anything goes sideways, we've got your back and we are there to make sure we get back on track and we don't have any slippage. Or let me, you know, Roger, I, I know this deal is just, this proposal has just gone to legal and we had, don't have a signed agreement, but what I'd like to do is sit down with our customer success team because I think what we'd like to do is roadmap out how we're going to go from installation to value. What are the key performance indicators we're looking at? Who should be involved? What are the, the obstacles we're going to want to look out for? This is built off of what we know great companies do when getting value out of our solution. We've been there. We've done that. We've got your back. And so that instills the feeling for the customer, any of those techniques. I'm not going to look like a fool for buying this. I'm going to look like a hero, actually. And so those are that's the jolt effect, four key behaviors. And again, we like it because it speaks to what's happening here. We're getting the customer from, I want this, to I bought this, which is the goal, of course, in sales. That was a great summary of the jolt effect. And I encourage our audience members not to assume that they've learned it all, but to pick up it because it is really packed with good information. Thanks. It's not a gigantic book, but uh, it is uh, really full of good info that uh, is, I think, actionable for uh, really any kind of sales process. So, um, Matt, how can people find you and your ideas? Sure. Uh, well, I'd love to be connected with any of your listeners. So if you heard me on the show, uh, by all means, send me a LinkedIn invitation. Uh, let me know you'd like to be connected. Maybe you have a follow-up question. Uh, hit me up with that. Uh, let's just stay connected and continue the, the dialogue. The other way you can uh, check us out is visiting jolteffect.com. A lot more information about the, the book and the research, a, a number of free resources on there as well, uh, to manage your coaching tools, things of that nature. And then also a lot of options for how we're helping companies enable those skills and develop those skills amongst their salespeople. Great. Well, we will link to those places on the show notes page at rogerdooley.com slash podcast. Matt, thanks so much for being on the show. I wanted to connect. It's uh, great to finally have that happen. Uh, take care now and good luck with the book. Thanks, Roger. It's great being here and uh, great to be connected with you as well. Mm -hmm.